Hello there. This video is a follow-on to the one I made the other day dealing with uh, antenna ground plane on the helicycle for VHF communications. Specifically uh, how I did it on my helicycle, which is N750 Golf. Uh, this is going to not be a very long video. I'm just going to go through uh, different kinds of coax and how to put a, a BNC connector on the end of, uh, of a coax. First of all, you should know that all coaxes are not created equal. Uh, this particular coax you're looking here is the stuff I use. It's RG400. It's very high quality. All of the uh, strands are silver plated copper. There are two uh, individual shields, one on top of the other. The dielectric is Teflon, and so is the outer jacket. And what I'm talking about, of course, is over here, this is the inner conductor, which is uh, twisted strands of uh, silver-plated copper. This is the dielectric, which separates the inner conductor from the uh, shield. And there are two shields. There's another one underneath this one, just one laying on top of the other. And you can see that they're very dense. Cheaper cables, you can actually see through the shield. And uh, they're not very effective. A cheap cable is probably maybe 70% uh, effective. This is 90, probably 95 plus percent. And the outer jacket is Teflon. Uh, now, the importance of all this stuff, of course, the, it's like anything else. The, the higher the quality, the better, and uh, you get what you pay for. Most folks are using uh, rather inexpensive coax, which is RG58. Um, and it has a either a foam or a solid polyethylene inner conductor, and it has a polyethylene outer jacket. Now, there's a couple things to consider. Uh, the outer jacket on most of those uh, cables is not UV resistant. And over time, contaminants migrate from the outer jacket and contaminate the dielectric. And so the, uh, the loss goes up after this cable's been outdoors for a while, the cheaper stuff. Uh, so what you want to look for in your coax, of course, is the size. Uh, this is the same basic size as RG58. Uh, they're both 50 to 52 ohms. That's the characteristic impedance of the cable, and that needs to match the impedance of the antenna and the impedance of the transmitter and receiver that you're connecting it to. And I went through why all this stuff has to match in my other video, so I won't go through it again. So in this picture here, uh, when you get your connector, uh, you've got to look up how to strip the cable, because all of these dimensions are critical. And it will tell you how far back from the end the dielectric needs to be removed. It will give you this dimension here, and it will give you this one back here. The other thing to pay attention to before you get too far along is you want to make sure that there are no loose strands sticking out here that could short the cable. Uh, I use a, uh, a little tool that's specifically designed to strip coax and you can see it does a very neat job. You can do this with a razor blade if you're very careful. Uh, the trick is you don't want to nick the strands. Uh, for example, when you're trying to cut the dielectric here, if you're not careful, you're going to nick some of these strands. They're going to break off. Uh, that's a no-no. You want to have everything looking just like this. All these strands are intact. Uh, they're all still twisted just fine. There's nothing sticking out. Uh, there's something called bird caging, where if you, if you pushed on the ends of this, this would all bulge out. It's got to look real nice, just like that. And uh, I strongly recommend that you get some RG400 cable because it's impervious to the weather. Uh, Teflon is not affected by UV, uh, so the outer jacket is good. The double silver plated uh, copper braid gives you very good uh, uh, shielding. 
which means there's less RF that's going to leak out of this cable and couple itself into the other wiring on your ship, uh, which can cause you some mischief. And the inner dielectric of uh, Teflon uh, also is very low loss. So this is a very good uh, mill standard cable. You can usually find this in small lengths on eBay. That's the best place to find it. So I would avoid uh, RG58. The other thing that I want to mention, if you have uh, RG58 and it has a foam inner uh, dielectric, you can squash that cable and short it out and mess it up. So if, for example, you took RG58 with a foam inner uh, dielectric and you cinched it down real good and tight with a tie wrap, you'd probably squish the cable, and that's not a good thing. So this stuff is not only uh, very efficient, uh, very low loss, uh, low leakage, it's also very rugged uh, because of the inner Teflon uh, solid uh, dielectric. <clears throat> so the first step is to solder on the uh, center conductor, the little pin. Uh, here I'm using a special tool which uh, I don't personally have. I did this at work, <coughs> and I know you don't have it. So we're going to have to use a soldering iron, and that's where it gets a little tricky. You don't want to get a bunch of solder on this thing. You want the solder to go in inside, not on the outside. And I will show you how we're going to do this with a soldering iron in the next, uh, next picture. This thing, what it is, it's a resistance uh, soldering method. There's an electric current that goes through these two uh, conductors, and when you grab a hold of that pin like a tweezer, it puts a current through the pin and heats it up, and it's perfect. This is the way you really want to do it, but nobody has this particular tool. As I say, I don't have one, so I'm, I'm guessing no one else does either. And if you look really close, there's a little hole right here, which is called an inspection hole. And that's where you're going to feed your solder, in there. And try not to get out here and get a big blob on the outside, because that's uh, going to be a nice precision fit into the body of the connector. So you're not going to be able to have any extra solder on the outside. Uh, also, bear in mind, you're going to want to use a 60-40, or yeah, 60-40 rosin core solder. Uh, and you can find that uh, my two favorite places are DigiKey and Mauser, M-O-U-S-E-R. Uh, and they're both online uh, internet companies that have uh, a very low minimum order. I think like 25 bucks is their minimum. And they'll ship the same day if you get your order in by like 3 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, so they're very good. Uh, they have a tremendous uh, quantity of uh, components on hand, and they're, they're fast, they're easy to deal with. So remember those two names, DigiKey and Mauser. Uh, others are Allied Electronics. Um, uh, yeah, that's enough. So look for Rosin Core Solder 6040, and uh, whatever you do, you want to avoid Acid Core Solder. Forget it. Uh, in the videos, BJ tells you to use acid core solder. Uh, BJ didn't know what he was talking about when it came to electronics or soldering, so disregard that, whatever you do. Here's a picture of that inspection hole, and that's where the solder is going to go. Uh, and that's not a very big hole. So bear that in mind when you're getting your solder, you're going to want uh, some fairly thin solder. It's called multi-core, um, and it's the only, you, you can't go wrong if you go to an electronic supply because they're not going to sell you anything other than rosin core solder. So the only question is, uh, how big is the diameter? Will it fit in the hole? And you can see here, um, I've tin plated or solder plated the outside of this, but I haven't added any, any material to change the dimension. And you can look through the inspection hole, and you can see that the solder has flowed in there very nicely, and I've got a good solder joint. So that's all very important. 
Uh, other things to consider is unless you're using a type of solder called eutectic solder, which is a very specific ratio of tin to lead, solder goes from a liquid through a plastic state to a solid as it cools. And if you wiggle that uh, solder joint while it's cooling, you can cause something called a fractured joint, which is a bad solder joint. A good solder joint will have a nice shiny appearance and although it's probably a little too small to see where my little arrow is pointing, uh, you should have a nice even fillet inside there. Uh, so that's, that's what a good solder joint should look like. The next thing you have to remember is the purpose of the flux is to remove any contaminants off the metal and prepare it to take the solder. And it is corrosive, not a lot, and certainly nothing compared to acid core solder, but even rosin core solder is very slightly mildly corrosive. And so you want to remove the uh, flux residue once you're done uh, using a Q-tip or a little rag uh, dampened in isopropyl alcohol. So get rid of all the flux, and that's true of any solder joint. Don't leave the flux on it. That's a bad, uh, bad technique. So now we've got the center pin on. Then basically you grab the center pin. You hold, you know, hold the uh, coax with one hand. Grab the center pin over here and wiggle it around in a circle. And what that will do is it'll fan the braid out like this. And we want to do that so that we can slide the uh, body of the uh, BNC connector on and it's going to go underneath the braid. You'll see that in the next picture. So there's the body uh, over here. This part of the connector goes underneath. So that's why we've fanned that out. You want to make sure you've fanned it out enough so that when you slide the connector on you're not bending a bunch of these uh, these little wires and squishing them all in there. You want to slide cleanly in there all the way up until the end of the braid is up here touching the end of the connector body. So that's why this dimension <clears throat> between here and here when you're stripping it is going to match the particular connector you have so that when this is in place the end of the braid will be over here. And in some connectors, uh, some of the better ones, and I like Amphenol, which you'll also find on DigiKey. And again, uh, when you order your connector, you have to look and make sure that it matches the RG400 coax that you're using. There's a lot of different uh, BNC connectors that to the eye all look identical, and they're not. The dimensions are slightly different for all the different kinds of cables that exist out there in the world, of which there are many. So make sure you've got a connector that's, uh, that's designed for RG400, if you're using RG400. Uh, and if you're not, again, let's go back to if you insist on using a full uh, dielectric uh, RG58, the cheap stuff, <clears throat> that foam has no structural strength at all. And so what can happen is the center pin can be pushed back in the connector through use. And so some of those connectors are designed so that when you shove the, the cable into the connector, uh, shown here in this picture, the pin will snap into a little detent in the body of the connector body inside there and that will keep that pin from pushing back out and with those connectors you might have to gently grab the center pin and give it a little tug once you get it all the way in there until it snaps into place otherwise uh, you'll find after you've uh, gone through a few insertion removal cycles that the pin is pushed back and it's not making a good connection because it's just uh, it's just push the uh, the foam dielectric out of the way. And it's it's not where it's supposed to be. So another good argument in favor of a solid uh, inner dielectric. Uh, and again, I like the RG400 because of all the reasons I mentioned. 
So now that the connector is almost in place, then you slide the uh, ferrule, which I hope you remembered to put on before you started. Uh, it's kind of annoying, but a minor thing. You get all this way and you go, okay, well, where's my ferrule? Oops, forgot to do it. Pull everything apart and then try and get the ferrule on over the, uh, uh, the shield that you've already fanned out. That's kind of a pain in the neck. So remember to put the ferrule on uh, if this is the uh, second connectors because you can't slide it over the other end if it's already got a connector on it. So make sure you plan ahead. Then the ferrule goes all the way down again until it butts up here against this part of the connector. Now we're ready to crimp it. So here you see two different types of what are called self-completing ratchet crimpers. And these are hex crimpers. This is a cheap one that I got for about 30 bucks. So it's an Amphenol. You see that little pin I'm pointing to? That goes into that little hole that you see on the other uh, die. I can't really point to it. Hold still. Anyway, there's a hole on one side and a pin on the other. That just lines these two up. Here's a little more expensive one. You can see, until it's completely uh, done, it will not let loose of the uh, of the crimp. So those are those are the ones you want. Uh, don't settle for anything less. Uh, it's got to be a self-completing one like that with a hex die of the right size. And again, when you get your uh, connector matched to your coax, then pull the data sheet and find out what size hex that you need and uh, then you got to run out and buy yourself a tool. So again, uh, both of these I got at the local electronics supply. Um, they're not the top end, but they're plenty good enough. And they were in the range of 30 to 45 bucks, something like that. It may seem like a lot if you're only going to crimp a couple uh, uh, BNCs, but um, they both have removable dies, so you can buy other dies for different purposes. So these are useful tools, and uh, I certainly wouldn't try uh, installing a connector without something that's at least as good as these two. Um, otherwise, you're you're uh, you're going to end up not being happy. Here's a picture of the uh, connector being crimped so you can see the back of the ferrule sticking out on the left side and the dimensions of the die are usually uh, etched on the die so you know which size to uh, stick it in and uh, you just squeeze it until the uh, until the tool will let you get the connector out at which point you are done it's simple it's uh, it's impossible to screw it up and that's what uh, industry has gone to long ago are these self-completing ratchet crimpers. So you can't do a partial crimp. It simply won't let loose. The last thing, and this came with a particular uh, BNC the connector that I bought, is a dual layer uh, heat shrink tube. The outer layer is what you're normally used to seeing. This stuff here is a black uh, PVC. The inner layer melts and uh, it really bonds the outer layer to the jacket and it makes a uh, waterproof gas tight seal here. So that's really nice if you can find that. And that serves two purposes. It keeps, uh, keeps the weather out of the connector and it also acts as a strain relief. And so uh, if you do everything that I'm saying and you use all these good, good tools and uh, get yourself the right connector and good coax, you'll end up with a good piece of cable that is going to last you for a long time and uh, is not going to deteriorate in the weather. And it's going to be uh, nice, uh, structurally strong. So unless you grossly abuse it, uh, it'll take quite a lot of punishment. And that's the end of that. So uh, again, you know, look at the antenna ground plane one that I did. Uh, that's part of the picture. 
um, that makes the antenna perform properly and then uh, getting the energy from your transmitter to the antenna is the other missing link that I didn't cover before and that's where this coaxial cable comes in the transmission line so thanks for watching uh, I hope this was of use and you can uh, read the printed version of, I, of, of this all I did is pull all the pictures out and slap them into this video but there's a more detailed description of everything I've just discussed uh, along with a lot more detail on my website at www.junr.com uh, you'll have to dig for it unfortunately um, it's buried in my uh, 400 pages of user uh, logs but uh, it's in there and uh, and it took me a while to find it uh, so I'm sorry I don't remember where it is, where it came from now but it's in there and uh, thank you for watching that's about it